Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be joined by the wonderful Krista Miller, who stars in the Apple TV Plus show Shrinking, as well as being music supervisor of the show. And with this show in particular, you know, you, you've talked a little bit about how you really saw every iteration of the scripts early on um, and all the different versions, even of your own character. I know at one point it was even written with the name Krista, <laughs> which I love. Yeah. And I was just, I, I love that as, as a performer and as an actor, what that gives you going into it and really understanding so many different details of the intention from seeing all those different versions. And so I was so fascinated in terms of what that gave you in terms of layers and really figuring out how you wanted to bring this character to the screen? Well, first of all, it's it, like, I'm not great at auditioning because there's never enough time. And I'm someone who really likes to marinate in something and do all the schmactory things and get a history and where I'm coming from. But I also work a lot with music because I'm, I'm tied to music a lot. And so to be able to look at this character and see the different iterations of it and then also be putting together the master playlist that I was going to be using for the season. I would be going down wormholes and reading scripts. You know, it, it was a really great opportunity because we did have it for a very long time and it was perfect. It's exact. It was like I was in heaven to have that much time and also like Jason would come to the house and I'm friends with Brett. And so it just felt already going into it, like a f that everyone had relationships too. I mean, in terms of relationships as well, it, it transcends into further than that in the production crew. Um, I know like Ben Weiss, who's an AD on the show was also in Cougar Town and yep. someone that you've worked with. And so there's in, in having people that you've worked with and that you really have that space of trust with, and particularly for a show like this that has such a beautiful tone in the way that it's mixing between the really serious heart-wrenching moments and the comedic moments, what does that give you in terms of just knowing it's such a space of complete trust? If I do something and it doesn't work, it's okay. We're not going to use it. We're going to move on. We'll take the time to find the right thing in a scene. Like, what does that that give you in terms of going into scenes, especially at the beginning of a, of a new show when you're really trying to finesse and find the beauty of that? And also you want to be, you know, you want to be serving the moment. You want to, there's a lot of things going into it. For me, I I can't do anything unless I know my lines backwards and forwards that I can do them with music on, with the television on, with Howard Stern playing, that I know them backwards and forwards. And so also when you have that time before the pilot, the, the, so you, that you have that going in. And I, I had all the time to work on all of the little things of Liz, but then to be able to throw it away and trust because you're on a set that there's, I mean, as the crew, Ben Weiss is everyone, but in particular, um, Jason feels that uh, the way he works, he's like, I just, I, I'd rather get the embarrassment out, out, out of the way. And he said something about when he was doing Forgetting Sarah Marshall, he thought the most vulnerable and embarrassed I can be is being naked on screen for seven minutes. And so I did it. And so right away, I got the feeling of just do it. You know, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And also, on, I remember on um, on Scrubs, although it was different because it was a broad comedy, my husband said to me one time, he said, you know, when you're off camera, after you've done your coverage, you're being really, really funny and really broad and doing crazy things. I want to see your off camera stuff on camera now. And I don't care if it falls flat because sometimes, especially in comedy, you're going to do something and it's crickets and then nothing, you move on. It doesn't matter. And so, so that's what it was going in. Um, sorry to have such a long answer for this. Also, we had our sets weren't built yet. So we were in Pasadena in a small house that our trailers were far away. So everyone would just hang there all day. They're really long days. And Jason doesn't do small talk. No one was doing small talk. Jessica has no time for small talk. And we were all just chatting, you know, just saying real things like getting in tears, like the, the second day about the script, about life, about things going on. And it made us close really fast. 
I love all of that. And, and especially what you were saying about vulnerability as well, because I think one of the really wonderful things about Liz as a character in the show is mm. she has this really tough exterior that everything's fine because she's such a caretaker for other people. And yet she's so incredibly vulnerable on the inside and, and episode by episode and scene by scene, you really allowed those walls to kind of come down a little bit and for us to see a little bit more moment by moment. And especially when you know that you want to kind of reveal more of that as the show goes on, is it something where you were thinking a little bit in advance of how you wanted that to gradually come out of her? Or was that so much of that, the, the journey that you were just taking and responding to the writing as well? Well, the right, it's definitely on the page. I mean, I always think when something's really good, you can memorize it very quickly. You know, it's when it's not, especially like for an audition, if you're trying to, and you're like, I can't, I can't memorize, and I'm good at memorizing. You're like this, because it's not right. And that part, that script was always easy to memorize, but the writers really meted that out through the show. But I felt when we, we started with her, but I didn't want, you to see it. I thought she was very insecure. I thought um, she probably doesn't have a lot of friends. You know, she's been like that PTA mom and running her kids' lives and doing all of that, which I don't do, <laughs> but, you know, doing all that, but feeling insecure and not really bonding with people. Um, so strong. I think she's really close to her husband. Um, I think they have a great, great marriage and a great sex life. Like I had all in my head, what I think in my head with of her character is that, but um, the, the, the writers really just meted it out. It, like it just went more and more. You could tell she's in Instagram. I mean, she's so obsessed with Gabby and, and wants to be friends with her so very badly. And, you know, the, the dynamic that she has with Alice a, as a parental figure to her is, is really lovely to watch. But there's also something where the more Liz and everyone around Jason's character, Jimmy, is encouraging him to really show up more as a parent, the more that pulls Liz away from, from that dynamic as well. And so did you find as well that more of those insecurities come to the surface in, in line with what that relationship with Alice looks like and how much time she's able to spend with her? Yeah, because I think she's panicking because... I think she's not just a meddlesome neighbor. I think she stepped up when someone really needed to step up and it definitely filled a gap because her last child was off at college. And then she knows she deep down, she wants Jimmy to be better, but she's also panicking. And, you know, I, I think a lot of my friends have got into a place that they go, what, what is there going forward now? What new, thing should we do? And I I always think, you know, you want, as you get older, your life should get bigger. You know, you don't want it to get smaller. You want it to get bigger. And um, so I think the realization of that was um, difficult. And I don't think she wanted to be that person to, you know, make sure that Jason doesn't, you know, step up Right. It's 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 such a transitional period for her as a character and especially just in terms of her own sense of identity. And OK, if I've if everyone has always told me I'm such a great mom and I'm a mom and that's the descriptive word they use. And now I'm not that all day, every day. Then who am I? And so going towards the the, the final episode, how much of a, a sense of self and discovery within herself did you want her to have gone on within that journey? Because you don't want to kind of tie everything up because you want to have more right. things to play to in the future, but you still want to have an evolution and an arc with that. Yeah. And there's way more things. I mean, I think she's still insecure. I don't think she knows what she is going to do. I mean, I know that because I have some hints about the second season. Um, I don't think, you know, the, the food truck's going to solve all her problems, um, uh, you know, they, she's got to figure it out. I mean, I have a couple of friends now that were like super moms and had four kids and did, and they both found these really cool businesses that they do and are really successful and really happy, but they went through a really difficult two years of going like, what, what's going on, you know, with my life. And I had a kind of different parenting situation because I always worked when I had my children, you know, so it's a little bit different, but I'm, I know that those, I just went through it with friends of mine and those couple of years are really difficult, just doesn't happen in a day. And you don't 
decide what you want to be in a, in a day or what your interests are. And I don't think rocks are going to cut it. I mean, you, you bring up rocks as well. And, and I love the fact that it's not just a detail that was created for the character. It's really based on that's a meditative thing for you to like go yeah. hiking, find them, you know, tumble them. And so every element in the show and, and the first moment it came up, I thought, oh, this is a, this is, this is a great moment for the character. And then it really develops and becomes so much of her. And even just that idea of what it means for her to give a rock to someone is kind of how she gives herself over to people, um, you know, and especially in that friendship with Gabby and that relationship relationship with her I also love the fact that she gives it to Gabby after she feels like you know Gabby didn't tell her about hooking up with Jimmy but it's like within that conversation she's like you're ready now like you've reached yeah. this place within our our dynamic and so what was important to you that existed in that friendship for the two of them for her to be at a place of of giving a rock to someone which is something that she holds so sacred well you know it was was why my husband wrote it in is I mean, the rock thing, I can't even go into it. It's so nerdy and embarrassing for me to even talk. Forget about the hiking and the finding agates. And then I have like a whole tabbing machine and a saw. Like, But when I, after I tumble them, I put them, as I as he put in the script, put them in glass jars in my bathroom. And since my kids were small, since they were small, they would come with their special friends and say, can, can I, can they pick a rock? And so I would bring a big bowl and they would, I'd either put them out on the carpet and they would feel which agate felt the nicest for them. And I'm not kidding. I have friends of my daughter, Charlotte, who will still text me. Um, I'm on a trip. A lot of her friends are models and they'll say, I'm on a trip and I have my rock and it's bringing me good luck. And I always keep my rock with me. And it was meaningful to me you know, to have that relationship. It made me have a relationship with my um, children's friends. And, and they were so excited to pick one that felt like it was a whole symbolic thing for them to pick it out. If you came to my house, I would let you pick out an agate that felt good. And even my mom, when my mom was here, she was like, can I, can I, can we dump them on the floor? Like there's some, cause there's um, um, agates when they're tumbled, after I've done them are, this is ridiculous to talk so much about, I guess, but they are like marbles, you know, they're, they're like glass. So they're, they feel good. Sorry. You're going to cut all that out. It's so boring. <laughs> no, I absolutely love it. And especially just in terms of, of Liz as a character, when you knew they were writing that detail into her, what did that tell you about personality traits or character traits that you felt were really important to her, knowing that that's also something that's really important to her that she cares so deeply about? Well, I, you know, it was funny because before, <laughs> during the pandemic and when they were writing it, I had my whole rock set up right outside in our house, like on our back patio. It looked like a, a ghetto house that, with this dust everywhere, the thing. And Jason laughed about it and Brett laughed about it. But I think when Bill wrote about it, he was writing um, um, about the character that she wants to make these connections you know, even though it's how she meditates, she wants to give people rocks and have that like sweet, that sweet uh, connection with people. And that's how she does it. So, right. So that's how she'll do that with a, with the, with Alice or with a friend. And maybe that's how, that's part of my love language too. Um, Cause you know, I'm, I can have a tough exterior as well. You also were, were bringing up food trucks and, and that journey for Liz as well. And one of the scenes that I loved the most for her as a character is that moment where she's fine, you know, she's saying out loud to Sean, I, I think I want to be part of the business and I want to be an active participant in this. And he, you know, doesn't even ask any questions. It's just like, sure, I'm going to go look at trucks this afternoon. Come with me. And just the way that she doesn't know how to process those emotions because she's so geared up for rejection. And so it was really beautiful to watch like the nuance in your performance in that moment of what does it look like when someone's been preparing themselves with like toughness and answers and rejection to then get everything that they actually asked for and wanted in that moment. And so did you go into that scene with a sense of, okay, how is she going to process this and what's her outlet in, in that response? Yeah, I had really worked hard on I, di I wasn't, I didn't really hang out and talk to Luke that much that morning. And I felt really embarrassed. Like I, f I was really in it with him. I mean, I'm lucky. I have to say, I'm lucky to everyone that 
I work with is so wonderful. You know, I really let it go. And then I can talk to them when I'm talking to him. I was really embarrassed. I, I, I feel like when I'm, when I'm working on this show, like I'm, I'm just following them. And then I don't know what he's going to say. It almost feels to me like, I don't know. And that's moments that you always feel it doesn't happen all the time, but really that you're in flow and you feel great. But, um, yeah, I felt that embarrassment. Like, what if he says no? Because, you know, I, and I'm not someone that likes to ask for help in general. I, I mean, this whole week when I was sick with COVID, my husband, like, what can I get? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, I don't like asking for help. I don't think a lot of people like asking for help. Um, I don't like to say my, I mean, I'm reticent about that. And so I definitely related. But I, to, yeah, it was hard. Then you don't know what to do. I felt I didn't know what to do with the answer. You know? Yeah, no, it's 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 such a great scene and such a great moment. And and I also wanted to ask a little bit about Liz's costumes in the show because there's there's kind of a recurring theme of like France and Paris in, in a lot of her shirts, like the Ritz Carlton Paris sweater, yeah. having like a, a sweatshirt with like writing in French. And you know, obviously exterior elements are also such a window into a character and certain details. And so what aspects did costume elements and even just that, okay, I I wear my love for France on on my sleeve yes. literally tell you about her. <laughs> um, uh, she, well, Alison Fanger is our, our costume designer and she's incredible. Um, and, you know, she wanted to, I didn't want to have her be, um, we interviewed a lot of different costume designers and she came up with like the storyboard and everyone looked exactly right. I think she does, does such an incredible job, but she wanted, um, I think Liz thinks she's a little cooler than she is, but I didn't want her to be like a Pasadena mom in her dressing. So I want, everything's a little off. Sometimes it's wrinkled. Sometimes it's too big. Um, I ha she's wears sometimes the same clothes as people do. Um, yeah. And she, she, I think she thinks she's maybe going to live in Paris. I, I think she thinks that maybe, you know, for in a couple of years where she's going to live in Paris and have a little apartment there. So she'll be ready. She's got the wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, she's ready. And in talking about the music as well, you know, it's 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 such a fascinating process because it's something that starts with the scripts and and really goes all the way through into post production. So every single stage, you're really thinking very judiciously about that. And what what were some of the key components or moments where you sat there with the script and you really had such an essence and such a sense in terms of okay, based on the characters in this scene and the emotional trajectory of this moment, you know, we really have to figure out the music beforehand or you know, against moments where maybe you want to kind of see what happens in the scene because it could play in a few different ways and really find it more in post-production. You know, I, when I make a list, there's always, um, I'll have like 20 songs that are like super favorites that I want to place in. And sometimes I'll get Bill to write, I'll, I'll make him like the song so much that he'll write it to picture. Like he'll include that in like Phoebe Bridgers we had, was written in and that makes it more fun because then it's perfectly it's like you it's like doing a music video you know then it's a really great placement but I always have but I don't get to use all of them because sometimes like the best song that I know it's going to take off if I put it on tv it just doesn't somehow doesn't fit in the season and I'll save it for next season but a couple of ones that I always knew was were um there's in the pilot, there's a song called Midair by Paul Buchanan when they're when he's with his wife and they're um he has a flashback with his wife and they're rolling around wrestling on the couch. Um that to me was so beautiful. And the end song was um Christian Lee. I forget his last name. It's called Endangered Birds. I when I heard it, I was like, this is the show. You know, it, if you listen to the words, I was like, this encapsulates the show. And I fought for that song at the end because um, a couple of people thought it was too sad and to end. And I really fought for it. Um, but yeah, but then otherwise I'm going through and a lot of times with Bill, I'll sp think something works and he's like, it's not quite there. And Zach and I were just talking, Zach Bradford and I were just talking, when you get goosebumps is then when I start fighting for it, because I'm like, I got goosebumps. I know it's right. I, I know that this song is right. Um, so 
Yeah, I loved I loved doing the music on this show. It's it was so fun. I love doing the music on Cougar Town and Scrubs. It's just when I get to really make the choices and do it, it it's it's just as a different experience work wise. It makes it more exciting to be at work, to be listening to music that might be in that episode. Right. And, and even going back to what you were saying at the beginning about, you know, when you're thinking about character and you're thinking about scenes and, and having different playlists, even just for yourself that you'll create and concoct, what's the difference when you're working on a show like this, where you're also doubling as the music supervisor against something where you're not involved in the music choices, but you're really just thinking individually about, okay, I think this would be the soundtrack for my character that I'm going into. Yeah. If I'm not the music supervisor, which yeah. I'm, Usually not because it's not my day job, but um, yeah, I would make my own playlists and have that playing for me. And when I'm working on a show that I'm the music supervisor, I'm only listening to going down work, to new music, to songs that could be possible to when I'm driving, harding things and then, you know, finding new music. It's only about that show. And also I'm in the show, you know, so it's, that's, that's right that it should be, but I would only listen it for my character for music going into a character, what playlists I made for that as well. And I and make it, them d- the dumbest ways I go. Um, I mean, I'm so not a professional music supervisor. Like I get to the editors. I'm like up tempo, medium tempo, sad, you know, those are that, that that's how they, they pull from my list because they'll pull things before I see it. But our editors are so great that what's such a treat is that they, you know, when they pull from my things, sometimes they place music in ways that I didn't think of. And I'm, I'm sometimes really surprised, you know, it's, it'll be offbeat or a song I didn't think would work there. And it does. And I'm, I just think it's a really collaborative effort. It is. And, you know, even just in terms of, of what the tempo was, I thought that having David Bowie modern love in the, in the wedding dance scene was such a, such a great choice, especially when you look at, you know, kind of catching up with all of the characters and the montage that they've created. What, what made you land on that specific choice for a scene like that? Because it, it's obviously the crux of, of the final episode. So there's so much weight on a moment like that as well. I had a bunch that I was playing for Bill and I had, um, I have a partner. I don't do it by myself. My partner is Tony Vaughn for purview and he helps me stay on budget. He also helps pick music too. I don't do it by myself. And he, we saved money in the budget. Like, so we, we knew we had the money to do that, uh, to have a big song. And I played Bill a couple of times and Bill and I, Bill said, I think it should be fast because it, even if pe- dance, people are dancing slow, like just have it off beat. And Modern Love is so fast and impossible to dance to. And I played it to him on the car. We we're going to dinner. I played it really loud in my car. And he was like, oh my God, we have to clear Modern Love. I'm like, I don't know if we can. And I don't know if we can afford it. And Tony, who's a rock star, cleared it. And I, when we shot it, Harrison's like, really? It had to be the fastest song in the world. It had to be the fastest song that you, Krista. I'm like, we got to do it. We got to have, we got to have Modern Love. And also that words are right. It's just, it's right. There's, there's also such a great choice in terms of when you use Sugar Ray every morning and that's, you know, Harrison Ford and Jessica Williams and their drive to work every day. And, and I, I heard you say that with, with Jessica Williams, you kind of, you asked her for a list of songs that she would yes. know every word to. And so what, what for you are like those moments where it's, it's not just about me sitting there with the script and really figuring it out, but it's such a central moment to the scene or a character needs to engage with it. So I really need to make it a collaborative process like you did there. For sure. I'm like, what, and also she's younger than I am. What cheesy song? Cause we all have those cheesy songs. Mine are going to be like from the eighties you know, English beat that I'm screaming in talking heads. She's going to have cheesy songs that she kn- knows that she loves that she's, that she'll have joy doing the scene. And then when she gave me the list that the Sugar Ray song was on it, I knew Harrison would know it because kind of everyone knows it. And I thought also that would be the most fun song. And, she, you know, yeah, she, she, she decided that song and gave me a great list of songs. I could have used any of her songs, but I thought Harrison would like that the most. It's such a great choice. And in and, and going back to like talking about your performance a little bit on the show as well, I wanted to ask about in, in relation to what you were saying before about that, it's such a journey for her in terms of opening herself up more and, and really kind of 
being allowed into these relationships as much as she's allowing other people into her world as well. And so how did that change the the physicality of the character for you as well? Because even just the body language of, you know, will this person be my friend is very different to, okay, we're best friends now and I'm giving you a rock. It's, you know what, I had done a couple jobs Um, as the pandemic was waning, but, you know, it was, we're still with the mask, you know, everything until just the very last minute, it was, it was different. And so this was the first job going back to work. And we were all really, really careful. I mean, we were kind of bunkered down in our house and to be around the first week of work, just to be around so many people and people that I know and love, I mean, crew I've worked with forever. I would come home. I'd be a zombie. I was so exhausted. I was so unused to being out in the world. So I felt like it, that came kind of naturally. I, I really was, it was so bizarre to be talking and busy and having, you know, having this life all the, all the time. Did you have that coming like after the, the pandemic? Like, I mean, I know you could work from home, I bet if you're doing the interviews, but it's still just being out in the world is exhausting. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's like one night out done for the week. <laughs> so you, you see, you, you know, I knew that feeling. And I also, I think the writers didn't want to rush, you know, the, with the Gabby friendship, it's not like it was slowly went, slowly got to a point that we were, and we're still not best friends in the show. You know, I'm, I want to be, I'm, I'm, be- I want to be best friends in real life, but uh, on this show, we're not, you know, I'm still trying. I'm hoping. There's also a lot. There's also a lot of great humor in the aspect of Liz is always the person on the periphery. It's like, even if other characters don't realize she's there yet, she's always there ready to jump in. And it's almost this like ongoing joke within the show, but played in so many different ways. And did that inform a lot of the blocking where it's kind of like, okay, Liz is maybe going to start at the edge of the scene and then she's going to be right up front and center because she also even just sometimes in talking to people will be physically standing a lot closer than anybody else would because she wants to be so in the center of everything. I feel like we crept up and then I, um, I decided, um, like mid when Jessica and I started being friends, I thought it's, I just want to repeat everything she says. So she's like mad at someone or saying something. And then actors in the scene be like doing the scene with you guys is annoying. That's annoying that you're repeating everything you said. And then it was really funny though. I mean, we let, it just became a thing because I I'm so enamored of her. So um, yeah. So then I, I, since I'm repeating, so, and then I'm going to come up close, especially in Zach's episode too. I'm going to, I'm, I'm moving in. He has me moving in all the time, you know, from, from the side. That's a really good um, point. That's interesting that you say that. And in working on the show as a whole, what did you find were some of the, the unique challenges for you and in really just shaping this character and finding aspects of your performance against other projects that you've done before? Um, You know, I have, I mean, for 22 years, I did kind of broad comedy. Um, You know, you're, you're, that, you know, I, I, it, which is it, which was so much fun. And there's comedy in this, obviously, too. I think working with Harrison and J- with, uh, with the whole cast, it was a lesson in really listening. Like, you're not, it's not the jokes are character driven as opposed to joke driven. And that was different. It was a complete learning process for, for me. I felt insecure going in. Um, I would feel insecure and, in, in certain scenes, um, I just hoped I would listen and know my lines and and try to do my best. And not going for a joke was different. Um, uh, I was I was just trying to do my best. It's it's such a fantastic performance, and you know I I love I love everything in that journey, and and how much we really get to see Liz open up throughout the season. So I'm so excited to see everything that's going to come in season two. So thank you so much, Krista. It's been really lovely. Thank you so much. It was lovely chatting with you. Really a pleasure.